Okay. So, hello everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Maisra, a second year and CZ resident at Jordan University Hospital. I'll be with you for this video and for subsequent videos talking about general topics of anesthesiology and particularly pharmacology of anesthesia. And so in this video, I'm going to start with the IV anesthetics, which is a very important topic in anesthesia pharmacology. Every anesthetist should have a good knowledge of these drugs. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, to talk about IV anesthetics, we have to refer to what we call the triad of anesthesia. The triad of anesthesia are the three main components that you have to accomplish to say that, okay, so this patient now is in general anesthesia status. Okay, so you should accomplish this component to set general anesthesia. Okay, the, the triad of anesthesia uh, has three main components. The first one is to get your patient sleep so he will not be aware of the procedure. And this component is the hypnosis. You have to hypnotize your patient because the surgery most of the times is unpleasant feeling that the patient uh, will not prefer to be awake in. Okay. Of course, there are some exceptions when you uh, do spinal anesthesia or regional anesthesia for your patient and uh, some people uh, prefer to be awake so that they can uh, witness the events that uh, are happening uh, during the surgery, okay? Like in cesarean section, for example. So let's get back to the topic. Uh, the hypnosis, you have to, uh, to make hypnosis to uh, accomplish the first element of the triad of anesthesia. The second thing you have to make your patient lose, lose his memory during the surgery, okay? And this is what we call the amnesia, the second important uh, element of the triad of anesthesia. So hypnosis and amnesia. And of course, the surgery or the procedure is a painful thing, okay? So you have to, uh, to give your patient an analgesia to avoid the sympathetic reflexes and the unpleasant feeling of pain during the surgery, the tachycardia, the high blood pressure, and so on, okay? So these are the three components, the three most important components of uh, general anesthesia, hip, uh, hypnosis, analgesia, and amnesia, of course. Plus, in some procedures, you have to relax your patient muscles so that you ease the field to the surgeon so that he can uh, have a good access to his uh, target organ, for example, the appendix, okay? So uh, muscle relaxation is not a component of the triad of anesthesia, but it is an important component of some other procedures. So we have some indications to use the muscle relaxation, not always, okay? So. IV anesthetics, we have to uh, remember the three uh, important components, the hypnosis, the amnesia, the analgesia, plus minus neuromuscular blocking agents, okay? So when we talk about the pharmacology of anesthesia, we are talking about the agents that accomplish these things, okay? So the drugs that accomplish hypnosis, for example, are the IV anesthetics and the inhalational agents, okay? Drugs that do amnesia are also the IV anesthetics and inhalational agents. Okay, the drugs that do analgesia are opioids, for example, or NSAIDs or acetaminophen. Okay, so we'll talk about all these drugs, and of course, the drugs that cause neuromuscular uh, blocking are the neuromuscular blocking agents, the muscle relaxants, and we also will talk about the muscle relaxants. Actually, the IV anesthetics action is not all about the hypnosis alone. It also, as I mentioned, uh, cause amnesia, okay? So the IV anesthetics actually action uh, is a broad spectrum that starts with the sedation. So if you give your patient a minimal doses of the IV anesthetics, you will make some kind of sedation 
okay if you increase the dose you will cause another action which is which is maybe amnesia okay so when you give your patient a minimal doses for uh, of midazolam for example which is an IV anesthetics one or two milligram you will sedate your patient but he will not be hypnotized okay your patient will not uh, feel asleep uh, if you increase the dose you may cause some kind of amnesia if you, if you give a dose that is less than sedative dose you may just cause an exorcism okay an exorcism and if you increase the dose a lot a lot you may, you may get your patient uh, into the hypnosis okay into the hypnosis so it is a spectrum of actions maybe start with an exit this is okay and go into sedation if you increase your dose you will cause amnesia to him and if you increase your dose more and more you will cause hypnosis you will cause hypnosis most of the times or uh, uh, in a lot of cases uh, we give IV anesthetics to uh, get our patients into hypnosis of course uh, we give our patient pre-medications especially uh, the children to do some kind of an exorcism uh, you know the children uh, have a fear or has a fear of procedures and they will be crying they will be uh, uncooperative so you have to give them something that make them more calm and uh, less uh, anxious okay and these are the IV anesthetics you can't you can give the children a lot of agents like ketamine for example midazolam and so on okay so uh, sedation okay sometimes uh, the patient experience uh, unpleasant feeling like uh, an accident or uh, you know the the procedure itself is unpleasant feeling so you have to give him something that cause amnesia like midazolam again okay and uh, 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 most probably most of the other IV anesthetics okay and most of the times we give uh, IV anesthetics to cause hypnosis hypnosis okay hello uh, now uh, when we do or uh, when we do a general anesthesia uh, in the past they used to use the inhalational agents the most discovered uh, or, or the uh, yani the most early discovered agents that cause hypnosis and uh, which was used uh, for this purpose is the inhalational agents the ether and so on okay uh, with time uh, the IV anesthetics were discovered and uh, thiopental was the first to be discovered and it was used for hypnosis uh, they used to combine the inhalational agents with the IV anesthetics to hypnotize the patient and this maneuver is still the, what we call the balanced anesthesia between the inhalation and the IV anesthetics is still uh, very commonly used in many countries around the world but now no, nowadays uh, we're using uh, or we're becoming more familiar with what we call the TIVA, the total intravenous anesthesia, the use of intravenous anesthesia alone to accomplish general anesthesia without the use of inhalational agents. In some, uh, in certain conditions, uh, where the patient, for example, uh, has a history of malignant hyperthermia, uh, and the uh, where the inhalational agents are a provoke. Uh, agents for the uh, malignant hypothermia we can use or it's absolutely indicated to use only the IV anesthetics because most of the IV anesthetics uh, like propofol uh, do not uh, get the patient into malignant hyperthermia okay so the indications for use of uh, IV anesthetics is to use it with other inhalational agents to accomplish general anesthesia in what we call the balanced anesthesia okay or to use it alone to induce the anesthesia to in, in the induction phase of anesthesia which we will talk 
uh, about in a separate video later which is the induction of anesthesia okay and also we can use it with uh, inhalational agents to maintain the anesthesia and the balance anesthesia or alone to maintain the anesthesia in what we call the diva the total intravenous anesthesia okay the total intravenous anesthesia so we use the IV anesthetics to sedate the patient to exercise the patient exercise the unpleasant feeling of the patient to uh, hypnotize the patient uh, in induction uh, and during the surgery and in uh, sometimes in emergence of anesthesia okay so this is the general uh, concept to introduce the IV anesthetic to use okay now when we talk about IV anesthetics we talk about what we call the ideal IV anesthetics the features that we wish in uh, to have in the IV anesthetic to be very ideal to be the super IV anesthetics and actually none of the IV anesthetics uh, now in use is ideal okay uh, all of them or each one of them uh, has some uh, features of the ideal IV anesthetics but none of them has the the all features of the ideal IV anesthetics and I want you to think uh, about uh, the ideal IV anesthetics in an organized way uh, actually you uh, to memorize it you should think uh, about it uh, in an organized way and uh, what I mean by organized way you remember when I want to use IV anesthetic in my patient the first thing I will get it from the uh, roof or from the freezer for example okay so the longer the shelf half-life of the IV anesthetics the better it is okay so when you have an IV anesthetic that uh, can be kept for a long time it will be of course better than IV anesthetics that will uh, be damaged or spoiled in a short period of time okay so the first feature of the IV anesthetic is long shelf life the second thing you want uh, you will prepare the IV anesthetic to be used for example the midazolam for example the propofol if the IV anesthetics uh, is uh, water soluble it will be uh, giving you the benefit of diluting this IV anesthetic for example we have the vials of uh, uh, 5 milligram midazolam okay in 5 uh, cc so you can uh, withdraw for example 2 cc of 2 milligram midazolam and uh, just dilute it in 4 cc so each cc will have a, a half cc of midazolam okay a half milligram sorry of midazolam and this is a benefit especially in pediatrics age group when you get to give your patient a very minimal or small doses okay propofol for example is not water soluble and you can't dilute it you can't dilute it to smaller doses but actually you have or we have a, a vials of many concentration uh, of propofol and so on okay so the more the uh, compatible the IV anesthetics the more the ideal it is okay so you get the, your IV anesthetic from the roof it is uh, it has a, a long shelf life which is good then uh, you dilute it with water it's water soluble it's compatible to use which is good and the third thing when you give the IV anesthetic to your patient you want an IV anesthetic that is not very painful not very painful okay some IV anesthetics is uh, are painful on injection just like the etomidate and of course the propofol okay the propofol is painful on injection the most commonly uh, used IV anesthetic worldwide the propofol is painful injection so we give uh, lidocaine uh, with it to avoid this pain or fentanyl sometimes okay so the less the pain for the IV anesthetic on injection the more the ideal it is the third thing you a long shelf life compatible to use water soluble 
not painful in injection and the third thing the third th or I'm sorry the fourth thing is you want to have an IV anesthetics that is not only not painful in injection but also uh, but also less irritant less irritant to the veins some IV anesthetics like uh, theopental for example are irritant and if you, you have an extravasation of this IV anesthetic you will have a tissue necrosis and damage due to these agents and this is unpleasant feature of the uh, of these particular IV anesthetics like the uh, theopental as I mentioned that is a uh, uh, and preferable okay so you want an IV anesthetic that is less irritant to the veins less irritant to the veins or the cannula okay then when you give the IV anesthetic you want an IV anesthetic that uh, rapidly move to the blood brain barrier and r rapidly go to the uh, central nervous system and do its action okay just like propofol or uh, the theopental for example so the more the rapid the action of the IV anesthetic uh, the better it is okay the better it is and furthermore the metabolism of the IV anesthetic should be a rapid one that does not uh, depend on the liver function for example if you have a patient with deranged liver function uh, liver functions you want an IV anesthetic that uh, m mostly independent on the liver function okay for example propofol propofol is extremely metabolized in the liver so whatever the liver is uh, function is deranged it will still be metabolized in an effective way okay and you want an IV anesthetic that does not have an active metabolite okay because an active metabolite will retain your patient uh, into the hypnotized uh, action and sometimes the uh, active metabolite will have a toxic a toxic uh, action that you don't want to have okay so uh, and also the active metabolite will uh, have unpredictable unpredictable action that you want to have so these are mainly the features of the IV anesthetics until now and furthermore when you give your IV anesthetics you want an IV anesthetic that won't uh, sup uh, suppress your cardiovascular system because in some patients uh, who has for example ischemic heart diseases if you give an IV anesthetics that suppress the cardiovascular system he will have uh, MI okay and you don't want this to happen so the, cardio, the more cardiovascular stable drug just like etomidate the more ideal it is okay and of course that applies to the respiratory system the less respiratory depressant the IV anesthetics the better it is again just like etomidate or ketamine okay so as I mentioned long shelf life compatibility or water solubility lack of pain on injection always remember that you have etomidate etomidate that is painful in injection and propofol of course and other agents local tissue damage we have a lot of agents that cause lot, uh, local tissue damage but the uh, famous one is the thiopental when you, you have local tissue damage you have, should flush your cannula you should give heparin and you should do sympathectomy if it is was severe to avoid thrombosis and so on okay and oh i forgot to say that the less histamine release or the less allergic the drug is the better it is okay rub it smooth onset with minimal excitation some of the iv anesthetics that we give cause some kind of excitation or myclonic movements that may be epileptic or non-epileptic okay for example in propofol uh, it will uh, giving the propofol we cause non-epileptic myclonic 
and excitatory movements that will last for just seconds okay so if we don't have these movements it will be better it will be more ideal IV anesthetic lack of cardiovascular system and respiratory complications or effect just like the etomidate and the ketamine okay and you get to give the IV anesthetic that decrease intracranial pressure and decrease cerebral blood flow okay especially in neurosurgery in neurosurgical procedures when the patient is having epidural hematoma for example or subdural hematoma you want to give an IV anesthetic that decrease the intracranial pressure because if you increase the intracranial pressure in a patient with tumor with a trauma with hematoma and so on you may cause your patient a herniation of the brain okay so uh, most of the IV anesthetics decrease the intracranial pressure and decrease the cerebral blood flow which is a great benefit